Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Ruth Halvoz. He is an evolutionary biologist from Leiden University and the Naturalis Biodiversity Center, both in the Netherlands. He does work in computational biology and contributes to various open source software projects. And by the way, he's also a patron of the show. So, uh, I know I'm butchering your first name, but uh, thank you a lot for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I, uh, I think you're, it, it's really neat what you're doing, and I thought I should support it. So there's not otherwise a conflict of interest there. You, you contact me first. And I thought, oh, this is cool. I'll sign up. So, so just for the audience that you know, how this came about. Yeah, sure, sure. Because uh, otherwise people will think that this is sort of a conspiracy theory involving the, the scientific enterprise or something like that. Not at, not at all. We weren't buddies already. Uh, you contacted me and I thought, oh, this is cool. I'll support that. So that's how it came about. Yeah. And thank you a lot for that. I really appreciate it. Okay. so. Basically, today we're going to talk a little bit about biology, some evolutionary biology, some particular general topics. So uh, let me first ask you this, because this is a thing that I've never asked before on my show, even though I've already spoken with a lot of evolutionary biologists and so on. But uh, when we're talking about uh, evolution by natural selection, when is, uh, where is it the earliest stage where we can already start talking about some sort of selection, uh, some sort of evolution by natural selection? I mean, what are the basic uh, ingredients that we have to have set in place? Because I, I guess that we would have to have some sort of things that natural selection is acting upon and some sort of variation there, right, for, for it to be selected, let's say. So what do we have to have set in place for that to occur? Well, um, uh, maybe this is really obvious for your audience because you're the, the people that you have on your channel, they're very respected academics, and uh, I assume your audience are not idiots either. But nonetheless, let me just uh, <laughs> digress a little bit. Um, evolution is something that happens at the level mostly at populations, right? So mm. kind of like in popular culture, the kind of stuff where they're like Pokemon and they change through their lives. That's not evolution, right? That's just development. Right. Um, so, so you need at least that. And uh, I guess in evolution, there's kind of two sides to it. So one side is the side that we've been observing change in fossils for a long time. Right? It's like people have been digging up fossils since forever, and there are some sort of you know, gradually we came to understand that there's these different stratigraphic layers and that these life forms kind of change. And that's sort of the story aspect of evolution, um, which most of the anchor points in that are really more provided by paleontologists. And it's more about, okay, physically, what do we find? Uh, the other side is really the mechanism mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, I guess every evolutionary biologist kind of leans more one way or the other. And in my case, I'm much more interested in the mechanism also on the, just as a computational biologist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense you can say, well, evolution by natural selection is like an algorithm, like a biological algorithm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've, I've implemented algorithms like that a couple of times. So one time it was really functional because I was trying to, improve on the parameterization of a neural network. So I made these populations of networks that have slightly different parameters and I had some sort of fitness function. And then over time, you see them converge on better and better parameterization. Mm -hmm. uh, and another time I actually did it as a teaching tool where um, I had this 
okay, so I'm also a coder, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about code. So I have this, uh, like a canvas, like just a screen where you can have different patches of colors. And in that, I had these little blobs, like a whole population of blobs, and they had a couple of traits. So one of them was their dispersal, so how they move around across the canvas. So every from one generation to the next, they make a little move. And the other is their color. Mm -hmm. And so on the canvas, the canvas has different patches or background colors, and the individuals have their own color. And that color was heritable. And so the way the game then worked was, well, the more you resemble the background color, the higher your fitness. So the, the, the smaller the difference in the two color values, the higher your fitness. Uh, so it's like a camouflage thing where predator, like you must assume there's predators that come in. And if you stand out too much in the background, you get eaten and you don't make it to the next uh, generation. And in implementing these kind of algorithms, you basically come across the simplest cases of what what the ingredients are that you need, right? So you need actually a population, and there needs to be variation in the population. Right. And that variation has to be somehow proportional to fitness, so how much you contribute to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be heritable. And there, there could be a little bit of a mutation rate in there. But that's basically the ingredients that have to go in there. So when we talk about uh, uh, where in the point of the history of life on Earth mm -hmm. all those ingredients are in place, um, well, I guess I suppose it took a while, right? Uh, of course, we don't really know. That, we don't know how any of that works, right? You can just make inferences about the biochemistry. Um, and I guess the thinking now, I suppose, is that there were these um, these sort of biofilms and these sort of membranes that kind of coalesce into a cell shape by themselves. And inside that, there was kind of an environment that was good to catalyze certain mm -hmm. like, uh, biochemical reactions and and gradually from that I suppose we might have gone through like an RNA world mm -hmm. and from there to DNA um, and at some point all the ingredients were in place including the heritability which I suppose might have been RNA the uh, uh, the whole population so a bunch of different of these cell like things and differences in fitness, and mm -hmm. you know that's many billion or many like four four billion years ago. I I don't know exactly, but yeah. sometime in the deep past, all those things locked into place, and then we were off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so let let me just ask you because isn't isn't it the case that nowadays in evolutionary biology biology the most prevalent uh, the most prevalent way of looking at, at things, uh, talking about units of selection, for example, is the uh, gene's eye view or a gene-centered approach, that is that evolution occurs mostly talking from a, um, talking about units of selection at the level of genes. So if we go back in history until a point where, for example, there were already uh, s strands of RNA or DNA, and particularly if they were already contained in cells and coordinating uh, some sort of metabolic activities going there, uh, if you go, if we go back to that stage back there, uh, do you think that we could already talk about natural selection occurring or not? Or only, uh, uh, we can only talk about it as we get uh, to the level of uh, individual, individuals, even if it's just individual cells uh, that are part of a population? Uh, uh, well, when we when we talk about the history of life on Earth, so kind of the history side, the side where it's only just cells, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm I'm a bit hazy on the timeline, but I'm pretty sure that's actually the majority of the history of life on Earth. Like sure. The majority of life on Earth is the slimy rocks, 
and, and yeah. winning late, late late to the game. <laughs> um, yeah. And and I, uh, I I guess so. For me, uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of on the gene centric side, uh, as you said. So sort of, I mean, selfish gene, the Dawkins kind of side. Yeah. Yeah, in general, that that's that's where I come out, and um, my sense is that we got there in the RNA world, right? Mm-hmm. So um, as soon as there was that code, and the code was heritable, and the code somehow translated into products that uh, has different phenotypes at some biochemical level, that was where it started, in my view. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but uh, I, I mean. Uh, the um, the things that the RNA or the DNA is coding for, I mean, is is it that natural selection um, occurs directly at the genetic level, or is it that it selects for particular phenotypes that are encoded by the genetic material? Do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Because Uh, sometimes there's this discussion between the several different levels at which natural selection occurs, and there are people that are more gene-centered, others that prefer talking about individuals, others about populations. There's there's even the thing about group selection, right? So sometimes it's a bit tricky. No, you're right. Yeah, it's uh, the gene-centric view is really about the code that eventually gets passed on, isn't it? Right. And and at some level, that is fundamental. But of course, that code that translates into phenotypes by very by very complicated pathways, which we are only in the process of understanding. Um, And yeah, it's. The other, the levels above that, I don't discount them, right? Uh, mm-hmm. so obviously, eventually the code that gets passed on is the gene, and then the gene leads to a product, and then the product in some context leads to a phenotype, and then the phenotype is, is you know, it, inherent in an individual. Mm-hmm. The individual is in a population, in a group, and in a larger lineage where there there is also in my mind, um, uh, selection at that level, right? So lineage specific, uh, taxon selection, they all play a role. And um, I guess the debate is more about the importance of the different roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all like in, in, indirectly, it circles back to that code that, that gets passed on, mm-hmm. I would say. Right. In right. Terms, yeah. like, a really roundabout way you know, where whole uh, lineages, whole branches of the tree of life are differentially selected. But ultimately, that's because of the genetics that they carry in them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I guess that sometimes this gets into an issue of philosophy or biology or something like that. I mean, it's just a matter of how we think about things and how they occur, right? Because I guess that even uh, if we if if we are applying the gene centered view, I mean Dawkins also talks about organisms themselves being vehicles for genes. So I mean even genes, it's not that they are interacting with each other directly. I mean it's basically through the phenotype that they bring about that organisms interact with each other and then certain genes uh, increase in frequency in a given population, for example, and others decrease or even are completely withered out, even though that's, I guess, rare to occur. But you you know what I mean. Yeah, and uh, so if you allow me to digress a little bit, uh, right now it's, it's kind of fashionable uh, to push, or it's, uh, some people are, are interested in pushing this idea of, the, well, the extended evolutionary synthesis. Yeah. I mean, you heard about that, right? So the idea that, well, you know, uh, individuals uh, uh, interact with their environment, they modify the environment, and that the environment uh, updates the kind of selective arena that they're in. Yeah. Uh, right? The idea that, well, 
the beaver builds the dam and then the yeah. dam builds the beaver <laughs> um, uh, and they kind of try to market it as this revolutionary insight and like, on the one hand i think it's a very interesting subject to interrogate uh, uh, maybe especially actually in the history of our own species just because obviously we started creating cultures we especially once agriculture came around we created these all different environments for ourselves and that in turn imposed selection on us and that is very interesting but it still it goes by way of the genes right mm -hmm. so to say well it's really extended and updated improved it's still essentially the modern synthesis we just take into account our interactions with the environment more explicitly, which is a good thing to do, but it's, it's not so, somehow a paradigm shift as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you agree, but people who talk about the extended evolutionary synthesis, one of the things that they refer to is epigenetics. And uh, I mean, sometimes I guess that they exaggerate things a little bit because they talk about at a certain point as if epigenetics trumps genetics and then we get into a place where it seems that we no longer have Darwinian uh, select uh, Darwinian evolution but rather uh, some sort of Lamarckian evolution where things occur during the lifetime of the individual and then they get passed on to the next generation and so on and so forth but I mean even epigenetic mechanisms that people find particularly in other animal models because I guess that in humans it's still a very crude uh, discipline I guess there aren't that many uh, epigenetic mechanisms that have already been established as existing in humans I guess but even I mean even the the epigenetic mechanisms people identify they also depend on the genetics i mean even the ways by which genes are torn, turned on and off it also depends on other parts of our genome uh, and things like that right oh of course yeah epigenetics is a really fashionable term but it, just, it means gene regulation right, right. so right. Yeah, something that needs to be regulated isn't it and um yeah, the, the thing about uh, evolutionary biology is that, uh, at least what I kind of came to find out, is that uh, over time there were these debates where people take really quite extreme positions. Uh, and I suppose we'll, we'll get to that. Oh, no, most of evolutionary change is epigenetics versus genetics or... Well, there's other examples like nature versus nurture or, yeah. you know, the, the sort of the uh, Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould debate <laughs> about, you know, saltationism versus gradually and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I guess the failing in some sense is that we in biology establish these verbal models which are quite complex in, in the storytelling. And we don't have nearly enough data to back it up or even what, just the, the right kind of stats and maths to actually express it in a testable way. And then, you know, uh, people sort of occupy the extremes. No, I think it's mostly this. No, I think it's mostly that. And, and mostly these debates then resolve in, well, it's a little bit of this and that both. Um, and, and that's, that's just kind of a general failing. And, and I suppose in the current epigenetics debate, it's the same thing, right? Like epigenetics is very gene regulation. It's very interesting. And um, it plays quite a big role and probably a bigger role than we thought before really the whole genomics revolution. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting topic, but to say that it somehow replaces or like it, it just it acts on genes so the genes have to be there obviously for it to 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 be in any way viable and um and that is being underestimated in the heat of the debate and the, the positions being taken up right yeah yeah and isn't it also the case that even 
da molecules that control gene expression. I mean, they are proteins for, for most of the time, and those proteins are produced by the genes. So it, it's basically, ultimately, it's genes controlling their own expression, at least to exactly, some yeah. extent. Yeah, most or a lot of the mechanism is uh, transcription factors, basically, right? Um, so, so those are still proteins, <laughs> which are still just gene products. So, <laughs> we're back to the code, aren't we? I mean, and yeah. there, there's a couple of other like methylation and other kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. well, but a lot of it is still it, there's just like it's really cool that we live through this time right now where we try to get a handle on how genetics actually works and what kind of genes are there in the genome. And it's a really interesting time, but it's still at the basic level, it's, it's genes and they encode for products and the products have some effects. Uh, there's more interaction than we thought, which is very cool, but that doesn't change the overall story, at least in my view. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and that aspect about culture and particularly human culture, because it is so complex, uh, particularly when comparing with other crude forms of culture that some other species have, like, for example, chimpanzees and other primates, uh, and even whales and dolphins also have s some forms of culture, like, for example, dialects that they have. So I've already had some people that do work on cultural evolutionary theory and things like gene culture coevolution. But I would like to ask you from an evolutionary biologist's perspective, uh, how do you think about the role that culture plays and the interplay between culture and biology? I think it's uh, I think it's a really fascinating topic and and clearly also with the human genomics revolution we're starting to see traces of that and some of them are basically pretty straightforward so for example um i'm dutch right i'm in the netherlands we're the cheese people <laughs> <laughs> well, when you look at the lactase persistence variant which is this enzyme that okay, it's it, it, it comes into expression. It helps you break down lactose, milk sugar, and the normal or the wild type, I guess, phenotype is that you only have this in youth when you're drinking your mother's milk, and then later it gets shut off. Um, but in uh, uh, cultures that started to consume milk and do dairying in various ways quite early on, a mutation that allows us to break down this milk sugar also as adults uh, rose in frequency. And I think the Netherlands has the highest frequency worldwide or something like that. I thought 95%, like almost everyone can just drink the milk, not have any problems. Right. <laughs> and, and so that, that is a really simple bio, biochemical kind of example of gene culture interactions. And of course, like many of these, there's also more directly connected to the environment, to elevation in the mountains. Some papers came out about that, like about the Tibetans, let's say, or about like diving in the deep sea. There's these, um, I think they're sponge divers in Southeast Asia. I'm a bit hazy, but, uh, and they have adaptations to essentially holding their breath for longer. And there's many of these, and it's uh, it's really neat to see that. And it's really neat also to, to see how relatively recent a lot of this is just because culture i guess human culture was relatively sta static for a long time as hunter gatherers in kind of small bands and then in the last ten thousand years or so we started to produce food and then live at higher densities and so that also brought in new pathogens and interactions with other organisms and it's a very rich kind of topic to to investigate mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, and even from a, 
uh, an evolutionary perspective, culture is another tool that we have at our disposal also to more easily deal with environmental shifts and things like that, that other animals don't have at their disposal. And for example, it's, it's harder, I guess, for us to, or for a population of humans to go completely extinct extinct if the environment environment changes drastically than probably other species that uh, don't have culture and maybe are not uh, so behaviorally flexible right yeah it's that also makes it a really complicated uh, topic obviously right so on the one hand we have sort of recruited all these other species uh, in our environment, which in some sense insulate us from shock and uh, we can produce our own foods in settings that previously were just inaccessible to us right. because they weren't maybe as productive. We hadn't really privileged a bunch of species. And then we have this plasticity where we can kind of update our interactions, learn from each other, um, like the same population of humans can just shift to a really different lifestyle and insulate themselves from environmental ins uh, like influence in a, in a really different mode. And so it's, it's also really hard to put your thing, finger on what exactly is happening, but it's super interesting, I would say. <laughs> yes, and that bit about behavioral flexibility, I mean, uh, how do you think about it from a, an a biological evolutionary perspective because I've already had on the show as well a lot of evolutionary psychologists and there's this thing that I mean to understand our behavior we also have to look into evolutionary theory and the types of things and environments we were exposed to during our evolutionary history because we also do that with other species to understand their behavior right but on the other hand it also seems that uh, i mean we can't uh, explain uh, our behavior completely just by looking uh, at things from an evolutionary perspective because we are a bit more behaviorally flexible than most of other animals and we are probably the most behaviorally flexible animal on earth and then we also have things like culture and we can transmit information to one another uh, verbally for example and uh, and through all other um, cultural means let's say so uh, i mean we have to deal with the, the two things in humans uh, uh, and particularly uh, if we are going to compare us with other animals maybe it's easier in other animals just to look at their biology to understand their behavior but it's not quite the same in humans right no yeah i, I agree fully um uh I'm a little bit cautious about some of the uh, evolutionary psychology arguments just because, well, on the one hand, I'm a big fan of uh, the comparative methods and looking across broad sets of taxa and kind of see how different traits correlate. And I think that's quite instructive. But you also have to realize that we are really, uh, in some ways, quite exceptional. Just if you look at, you know, our brain mass over body mass, is essentially off the charts and that is for a reason and uh, you know it is just it gives us so much more plasticity in our behavioral patterns that you can't easily translate things like sort of the conclusions that you might draw about mating systems or aggression or all these sort of you know controversial topics it it's not so simple to say well if that's the same in chimpanzee warfare, then that must be by first approximation the same in humans. Well, you know, we are still quite a ways away from chimpanzees in the flexibility that we have and in the complexity of this cultural matrix that we're in. And so 
it's I mean, it's easy to draw these inferences that actually might not really apply to us, um, and and it, I think it's it a bit of caution is warranted in that respect. Mm -hmm. And since we're talking about that, I mean, uh, at least it seems to me that we have some human universals, that is, things that all of us as a human species share, both uh, uh, physiologically, for example, and also psychologically in terms of behavior and things like that. But then uh, one thing that I would like to talk with you about today, uh, and I, I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm just remembering our Twitter exchange about races and things like that, because uh, this is very interesting, because different human populations have been exposed during their evolutionary history to different environmental eco slash ecological conditions. And so there are some specific adaptations that are different across different populations from an historical evolutionary perspective. But then nowadays, because people move so much from one place to the other. I mean, things have been mixing quite a lot. And so, I, I mean, uh, do, do you agree that it still makes sense for us to distinguish between different human populations that evolved in different places and maybe talk about things like using terms like population or ancestry, for example, but maybe things like race, at least as it was traditionally defined, and uh, talking about, for example, Europeans and Africans and Asians and uh, uh, American peoples. I mean, nowadays, maybe that, that uh, division, as people have, uh, before doesn't make sense anymore, right? Yeah, I think I, I think I, I agree with you. Um, so when we when we think about traditional race, um, so race is not a biological term, right? So like in biology and in Linnaean classifications, race is not a thing; uh, it doesn't exist. Race is. I mean, I don't want to say it's just a social construct, but to quite a large extent, it actually is, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, categories that we, in the traditional view of race, uh, distinguish are much more diffuse than the absolute boundaries that we think we can establish. Mm -hmm. right? and, and a lot of that is actually shaped by culture, for example, like the kind of the, the, the one, one drop rule, I suppose, like, okay, who's black, who's not black yeah. in North America? Well, a lot of that is just the uh, categories that are imposed to, to meet the requirements of that particular kind of racism and slavery mm -hmm. and have not a lot to do with actual ancestry, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and when we look at what we can see in uh, the actual genetic diversity of human populations, well, there's kind of like a fractal pattern in there. So sure, like if you if you go a little bit beyond just self-reported racial categories and you try to find out, okay, what is m the prevalence of your ancestry, and and people can identify that by continent. And sure enough, we can see that in genetic diversity, like you mostly cluster, whatever, European, Asian, African, New World, Australian, etc. Um, but there's also, uh, like you can zoom in and you can zoom out to, uh, at this point, to pretty ridiculous levels of detail. For example, like a bunch of papers came out quite recently, about the genetic diversity in, let's say, Finland. Now, uh, anyone who's not Finnish thinks, well, all the Finns are <laughs> kind of one of the same. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then when you actually look at, okay, so part of Finland was uh, for a long while 
basically a possession of the Swedes, and the other half was Russian, and the boundary was pretty strong, so there was kind of a sort of mating between two populations, and actually you find that when you zoom in on the genetic diversity there, um, and th there was another paper, for example, by Britain, where they looked at, uh, well, they, they selected candidates for genotyping, and they asked them, like, did all four of your grandparents live within an area of like 50 kilometers away from each other, something like that? Mm -hmm. And look, if it's your grandparents, which is like maybe 80 years ago, before that, there was another thousand years of more or less that <laughs> state. Um, and, and sure enough, when they did the analysis, they could find the rough boundaries of some of these uh, Saxon kingdoms, even uh, right. So, so there's you can zoom in on that, and you can zoom out at the continental level, um, and so there's there's obviously a geographic structure in human populations, but I wouldn't say that it necessarily maps on the kind of categories that we have planted in our own minds because of colonialism and racism and other types of bigotries. So these are not really compatible categories. And I'm comfortable saying, well, there's different populations and entities, but to say that this somehow fits with, you know, the categories that we uh, came up with by skull measurement 100 years ago, no. Uh, not to my mind, at least. It, it's more subtle, it's more uh, fractal shapes, and, and there's a lot of... Um, well, it's it's um, it's not shaped as you know at higher level. Okay, so I'm an evolutionary biologist, right? And a lot of the work that I do is to look at well, can we kind of figure out what the species boundaries are genetically? For example, when we look at a group of butterflies or something like that, right? And then what we look for are these isolated lineages that really have this history completely separate from others and like the technical term for that is monophyletic um, and that's not at all the case in humans right it's more like a mesh where there's gene flow between the different populations and we can't really draw absolute boundaries between the populations we can make rough inferences in relation to other individuals okay you're a bit closer to this than to that but these real categories that we thought existed, well, it's it's more complex than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, I don't know if you agree with this also or not, but I guess that you would, because I, I mean, you're not denying that there's these differences between different populations, roughly speaking. And for example, in terms of medicine, uh, I mean, it's useful at least sometimes to know that people are from this or that origin because there are certain aspects of their physiology that differ between places. For example, there are people from sub-Saharan Africa that are lactose intolerant and it's useful to know that. There are people from Eastern Asia that uh, because of the way their liver functions, I mean, it's harder for them to metabolize alcohol and so it um, I, I mean, they probably shouldn't drink as much, otherwise they would have health issues that maybe people from Europe and the United States wouldn't have as much, only if they drink quite a lot. So, well, I've been I'm, told by my Japanese friends that you can train this, and so a true samurai can, can still pound up <laughs> quite a few drinks. So, <laughs> but but yeah. Yeah, I, I take your point, sure, that there is some variation in some of the, the biochemistry. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's quite a complex picture, like you mentioned. Um, lactose intolerance in uh, sub-Saharan Africa yeah. and also there there's variation like there's obviously societies that have had varying for quite a long time and actually so in some uh, sub-Saharan African groups it's it's quite the lactose tolerance let's say is quite high but in general sure there's differences and um, it's we mustn't be ideological about these mm -hmm. things 
I mean, you mentioned these examples. There's also others that are really directly of medical importance with things like sickle cell anemia or different blood clotting agents and so on. And we we have to come up with way like with quite simple heuristics. So we can say, well, you probably respond to this medication better than to that medication. Um, it's it's something that we have to take into account. So obviously, we want our, our medicine to work. So so yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, medicine is it's mostly statistical. So I mean, you look at someone and the person has a very dark skin or something like that. I mean, and if uh, and with the other data that the doctor might have access to, then maybe it's easier for him to establish a differential diagnosis and more easily diagnose the problem that that person has, even though, I mean, she could be dark skinned and e e even so have more uh, European ancestry or something like that. But I mean, it, it's useful to use those sorts of heuristics uh, because uh, things are mostly statistical. And I mean, <laughs> even in medicine, doctors can't be can't be 100 percent sure of the issue they have at hand, they have to collect all sorts of data, right? And I mean, just looking at people and sort of heuristically determine where should, where should, um, what should be their origin or something like that. I mean, it's useful, right? Yeah, although I, I guess I imagine that um this is going to be more and more data driven over our lifetimes very quickly. Right? Uh, the, the, the cost of genotyping and sequencing is really dropping. And so I spoke uh, very shortly also for things like cancer treatments and so on. It's just going to be uh, based on genomics. Mm -hmm. um, but but in, at some level, uh, a well-informed doctor, I guess, would be able to draw some inferences uh, by proxy, mm -hmm. but, but that's uh, that's going to get more and more detailed uh, very soon, I think, in our lifetimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about things like g genetic profiling and maybe using that to create some sort of personalized medicine that is instead of relying on these heuristics and simply looking at the external characteristics that people have, like, for example, the color of their skin or the configuration of their skulls or something like that, to, to, to be more direct and use really more objective information. Yeah, the, the, uh, I am... Um looking in the crystal ball, <laughs> I, I would expect this to become more and more data driven, right? There's all these studies coming out, how different SNPs correlate with, I don't know, like how you respond to blood clotting medicine or, or you know, uh, this cancer treatment versus that. And so it, it makes sense that we would just check, okay, what, what configuration of SNPs do you have and can we tailor your treatment to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but then you get into some complicated issues, like, for example, if certain traits that you have and that occurs with many of them, I guess, are polygenic, then, uh, I mean, even when people do those kinds of studies, for example, GWAS, that is GMO, Genome Wide Association Studies, I mean, they have really to have a huge number of people participating like in the millions or something like that to be able to step by step identify the uh, the the genes that are associated with that particular trait right and in certain cases it's really really hard to uh, to, uh, to identify them correctly well that's that's true but but uh, trying to conclude from somebody's ancestry that is even more indirect, right? That's like yeah. saying, well, I guess you look like you uh, have mostly this ancestry 
and uh, in that group, there's this variant has slightly higher uh, frequency than in that group. Therefore, I can, etc. Right. There's, so there's this sort of chain of assumptions, uh, and over time, I guess we get more de a more detailed view of the mechanics and of what the exact variants are that correlate with that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me just ask you one last question, something that I left behind because we went into the topic of human variation and things like that. Uh, and I would like to ask you if uh, nowadays in evolutionary biology, is there any uh, strictly defined set of criteria for us to know uh, if something is an adaptation or not, because I, I guess that throughout the history of evolutionary biology, that has been a very contentious topic, right? And uh, mm, through most of its history, people didn't agree on uh, the set of criteria that they should use to determine that something is an adaptation or simply a byproduct or something like that, right? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's really hard to say. Um, there, you'd have to have um, a lot of experimental data, don't you? Mm. Right? It's like um, you can make, uh, uh, I guess you could set up a hypothesis of, okay, this trait, I think, it has this role in, in fitness, and therefore it should be an adaptation and not just some sort of pleiotropic uh, effect. But it's really harder, it's, it's complicated to actually really persuasively uh, figure it out um, whether some particular trait is an adaptation or just something that's there. So uh, yeah, uh, long. Uh, I guess the <laughs> we're not there. We're not there yet. It's uh, it's complicated. Oh, the, uh, really? Because I mean, the, the, that's that's fascinating. Because I guess that after so many decades, people would have already agreed on a set of criteria. I don't know what type of criteria to to really go and be able to decide that something is really an adaptation or any other sort of thing? Well, that, that's a slightly different quest, question. Like, have, have people tried to enunciate the criteria? I'm yeah. sure they have. I'm sure there's plenty of papers where people sort of try to say, well, this is the list that you need to look at. <laughs> but in reality, it's, it's complicated, right? It's, uh, you see some trade in the field and you think, well, this, I don't know, makes it easier to break the big seeds or camouflage you from the predator, but then you have to actually go and measure it before you can say at all, right? So it's hard, it's hard. But I, I mean, what are the types of things that you can do to try to establish that something is an adaptation? I mean, you can go, for example, and look at the species behaving in its, in its natural environment to see uh, how it uses its tools, let's say its physical tools, and if, for example, uh, and looking at variation among individuals to see, oh, if, uh, for example, if we're talking about a bird and one of them has a shorter beak and another a longer beak, if uh, looking at both types and see which is the one that increases uh, the bird's fitness and things like that, and maybe also using some sort of <clears throat> computer modeling or simulation to uh, create variation uh, uh, variation in the population, for example, and see which is the trait that increases fitness and things like that. No, that well, that that's true, and um, actually, I, I guess you're probably thinking of the Galapagos finches, right? Yeah, <laughs> a long time field work that I think they're called Grant, the Grant couple, um, and uh, so they did field work there. They looked at the finches, measured the beaks, and they looked at the availability of seeds from one year to the next, 
And then they could kind of establish, well, in some years, some plants did better than others. So there was more of an abundance of this size category versus this size category. And sure enough, the big beaked finches had um, higher survival rates than the others. But that's that's one particular instance, and that took yeah. decades to establish. And and so that that is in general the problem. Like you really you have to do go into the wild, do these measurements, and look at it through the generations. So um, it works a bit better if you have shorter generation times in your organism, and then you can establish it to a level where I'm convinced. Um, but but it's difficult. It's uh, I, I wouldn't say there's some sort of general rule. Um, I mean that thing about having shorter generations. That's one of the reasons why in biology uh, many of the animal models that you use are insects. Right. right yeah. So that that's always kind of disappointing for aspiring biologists. Like we all love you know the elephants and the panda bears and the dolphins but if you actually want to study adaptation you're going to have to look at i don't know fruit flies or stick insects or some like if it's le ideally it's much less than a year generation time and maybe a year then it's one field season to the next that's all right but it, these things that stick around for decades <laughs> what they do right <laughs> that, that's not really going to work so that, that's a bit disappointing always, yes. Yeah. And of course, then bacteria or slime molds or something like that. <laughs> that's kind of ideal uh, in the sense of studying the mechanism, but it's not nearly as charismatic. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you were talking about elephants, for example, and I guess that some of it must also have to do with ethical questions, right? Because there are some animal models that, I mean, we can't do whatever we want with them because they also have uh, complex mental lives and we might be inflicting pain and suffering on them. So, I mean, maybe that's another reason why uh, it's easier even for us to feel better with ourselves to work with insects and bacteria <laughs> and things like that, right? Yeah, there's that level of ethics. There's also the conservation aspect, uh, right? It's like uh, uh, a lot of the experimentation is sort of these uh, reciprocal transplant experiments where you take part of the population, put them in another setting and vice versa and see how they do. Um, but with things like orangutans or, or elephants, there's these distinct populations which we would like to retain so just moving them around, <laughs> loading them all on the truck and see how they do somewhere else, that's just not going to fly even from a conservation perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that in the near future, things like synthetic biology could help us better understand those sorts of questions like what is an adaptation and what is not in, sp in different animals? Or I think it might be. Um, yeah, the, the neat thing uh, about it uh, is these uh, attempts to really try to come up with what, what sort of the minimal genome that you need and then see, okay, what happens when we swap out certain modules. Um, and so as models, that's, that's really interesting. And, and we could, I, I expect us to be able to sort of establish these minimal cases of uh, adaptation at a really biochemical level and yeah yeah i, I think that's that's going to be uh, informative sure yeah mm -hmm. okay so Rutger, let's end the interview here uh, before we go would you like to tell people what might be some good places on the internet for them to find a little bit more about you and your work and i don't know if you want to make a bit of publicity to the naturalis biodiversity center or not sure yeah thank you yeah uh let's see so the uh, uh natural history museum naturalis where i work is the uh, the dutch national um museum for paleontology and, and stuff like that uh, we are reopening in a new building august 31st and so if you ever visit the netherlands 
I'm, I'm prepped for the commercial. <laughs> I've never visited the Netherlands, uh, so from the airport, the national airport, it's like 20 minutes by train, and then from the train station you can walk to the museum. So after this August, the museum has reopened, and it's going to be a lot of fun. The building looks very nice. We've just moved in there, and uh, I heartily recommend that. Um, another thing that I would like to plug, if you allow me, is um, so there's this podcast that I sometimes contribute to, uh, which is called The Got Academy, mm. GOT Academy. And uh, we do podcasts which are a little bit playful, but there's also science in there. And uh, but then in the context of movie reviews. So, for example, we had an episode where we looked at these natural disaster movies which have these sort of extinction level effects and then look at, okay, does it even make sense what Hollywood makes out of that? And that was fun. And we looked at like, okay, the representation of eight men in uh, movies. And uh, I invite people to check that out. Okay, great. I that so, out it, of <laughs> so it's Got Academy, right? Yeah. Yep. Got, got is Game of Thrones, right? Originally, yes. But Game of Thrones has ended disappointingly. <laughs> uh, and now it's just, that, okay, we talk about movies and series and, um, and try to connect that to some actual substance, right? So it starts out with, okay, we watch this and, well, what does it actually speak to in terms of science? Um, and, uh, and we have fun together, so. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I also thought that the ending of Game of Thrones was really disappointing. So. Oh, terrible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, let's disregard that and move on to the better stuff. Uh, Stranger Things 3, 3, I thought was very good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay, great. So, Hutchel, and again, sorry if I butchered your name during the interview, but I mean, uh, Dutch names uh, are not for me, I guess. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condreano, Janne Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervoz, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.